we have assembled ourselves together for the most solemn phase of our worship service, the Lord's Table. We now have the opportunity in the communion service to test our concentration, to test our knowledge of the Word of God, including soteriology and Christology. Communion is a test of our love for God, which is the key as to why communion was ordained in the first place. This is so that we might recognize everything that was accomplished by the integrity of God in eternity past, taking our Lord to the cross in hypostatic union. Communion is a test of our love for God as listed in 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. This is the concept of reciprocity, which we will note slightly today. It is the ultimate in the communion service when we reach the point of occupation with Christ. The communion service is a test of concentration under the filling of God the Holy Spirit, our mentor and our teacher, and the one who brings to our memory those things we've forgotten. The ritual is very important, for ritual without reality is meaningless. The bread represents our Lord in hypostatic union and the integrity that came from his unique spiritual life and how it took him to the cross. He endured the cross despising the shame and was seated at the right hand of God the Father. The bread represents the righteousness, the uniqueness of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cup represents the salvation work of Christ on the cross. Beyond that, it represents our post-salvation spiritual life which describes the blessings that came to us as David announced, my cup runneth over. There is emphasis on the rebound technique, 1 John 1, 9, for there's a warning given to us in 1 Corinthians 11 in which if you do not rebound before partaking of the elements, you will be under liability for punishment in three categories, warning punishment, intensive punishment, and eventually dying discipline. For whom, for whom the Lord loves, he punishes and skins alive with a whip every son whom he receives. God has mandated that all church-age believers observe the communion. It is the only ritual still in existence in the post-canon period of the church age outside of the marriage ceremony. 1 Corinthians 11.24 says, Keep on doing this in memory of me. This is a way for us to remember our Lord a test of concentration always, and a test for something far greater, our love for God. In preparation, therefore, for taking this examination, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the option to name your sins to God if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we are grateful that in eternity past you knew all about us. You knew about our successes. You knew about our failures. And you understood and knew long ago before we ever existed these things. Therefore, we have the opportunity to learn about you and the work of Christ on the cross and what it means to our eternal status. May God the Holy Spirit give us the concentration necessary to meditate upon these things as we are mandated to do as part of our worship service. We ask these things in the name of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, even Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. I will now have Brad pass out the bread, and it is our custom to retain the bread until all have been served.
He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iquity. The chastisement of our, of our peace was upon him, and by his bruise we are all drawn together. For all we are like sheep and have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. The Lord made a very important statement. He said, This represents my body, which was given as a substitute for you. Our Lord also said, Take this bread and eat it. So take all of you and eat. We are grateful, Heavenly Father, for remembering you through the cup. We pray that God the Holy Spirit will make this very real to us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I'll have Brad pass out the cup, and it is our custom to retain the cup until all have been served. We have not been redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from our empty manner of life, but by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord cook took the cup, saying, This represents the new covenant of my blood. Drink ye all of us. Let us all stand as we sing. Let us survey the wondrous cross. small love 
We will now move on in our study of Galatians. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. Galatians 3, 23. On Friday, we went over four points on the inferiority of the law. And we will review these four points very quickly. Four points on the inferiority of the law. We got these four points from Galatians 3.19, Galatians 3.20, 3.21, and 3.22. Now in Galatians 3.19, the Mo- it explains one of the reasons why the Mosaic Law is inferior to the law of grace. It was added at the time of Moses and abrogated by the cross. The Mosaic Law was added at the time of Moses, meaning Abraham did not have the law. The law came at the time of Moses. It has been abrogated by the cross. Once our Lord died as a substitute for us on the cross, so died the law with him. Why? The law was a curse. So that which is not permanent is inferior to anything that is permanent. The promise to Abraham is permanent. The promise to Abraham, Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness. So the promise to Abraham, faith alone in Christ alone, that's a permanent law and exists today. So people in the Old Testament were saved in the same manner that people today are saved. So Galatians 3.19 explains reason one why the Mosaic Law is inferior, and that is because it's uh, temporary. It's transitory. It was abrogated by Jesus Christ on the cross. Reason number two. Reason number two is from Galatians 3.20. And that is the law has an inferior mediator. And we studied that. The mediator for the law was the angels. And the angels aren't man and and they are not God. So therefore it's inferior. The perfect mediator is Jesus Christ. So the law came from angels. Therefore the law has an inferior mediator. Galatians 3.20 Reason number three is given in Galatians 3.21. The law cannot give life. The only thing the law can do is curse us. The law cannot give us eternal life. Yet most people follow the law thinking that somehow by following the law God will be impressed with them and therefore allow them into heaven. Nonsense. Then we have reason number four. And that's found in Galatians 3.22. Reason number four. The law is a jailer and not a savior. The law curses us. The law sends us to jail. It is not a savior. The law is a jailer and not a savior. Galatians 3.22. So now we move on to Galatians 3.23, the purpose of the Mosaic Law. And we studied on Friday some of the purposes of the Mosaic Law, but today we will continue on with Galatians, which gives us an insight into the purpose of the Mosaic Law. And this is what it says. Now before the faith, we were incarcerated under the law, shut up with regard to faith about to be revealed. So now before the faith, what's that mean? It means before we were saved. Now before we believed in Christ. Now before we were saved, believed in Christ, before the faith, we were incarcerated in jail under the law. And in the Greek, this is a mood of reality that we were constantly jailed under the law. We were in a constant state of being in prison. That's that's the only thing the law can do for us. Shut up in a prison cell is what it means. Shut up in a prison cell with regard to faith about to be revealed, meaning at the right time, God the Holy Spirit would reveal the way of salvation and some would believe. Therefore, faith is about to be revealed. 
so principle out of Galatians 3.23, the law could not bring us to faith. The law is a wall separating us from faith. And if people try to follow the law, they'll never be saved. If they follow the law, they're trying to climb a wall and they'll never get over it. So that's Galatians 3.23. Now let's look at Galatians 3.24. Thus the law had became our pedagogue. Pedagogue is P-A-I-D-A-G-O-G, -G, not schoolmaster. The schoolmaster has no meaning to us. We don't have schoolmasters today, I don't think. Do you have schoolmasters in school? Never heard of it. I don't know what a schoolmaster is, and uh, this is the way they uh, translated it, but it has no meaning. Thus the law had became our pedagogue, P-A-I-D-A-G-O-G. -G. Now the pedagogue is more like a school bus, which we will note in a moment. Thus the law had become our pedagogue, which leads us to Christ, so that we might be declared righteous, righteous here in the Greek once and for all by faith. And then we have the subjunctive mood once again, and the subjunctive mood, mood means that you have to make a choice to believe in Christ. It's by volition. So point one out of Galatians 3.24, a pedagogue was a slave. What does all this mean? You have to know the history of the time to even know what Paul is saying, which means if you're going to be a pastor teacher, you've got to do a lot of study to understand all these things. Otherwise, you'll just be lost like everyone else. A pedagogue was a slave who would take their children to school. In the Roman world, they had a lot of slaves. And usually, if you were a middle class and well-to-do family, you would have slaves who would take care of your own children. And what they would do is they would take them to school and keep them safe. Of course, they didn't have school buses. They would walk them to school. Or maybe even, if they were very wealthy, take them to school on a chariot and keep them safe from kidna kidnappers, etc. So we would understand pedagogues today as a school bus, a school bus that takes you to school and for the most part at, at least try to keep you safe from all the predators out there. So what this is referring to is the fact, by analogy, the law takes us to Christ like a school bus just as the law took the rich young ruler to school. What was it that brought the rich young ruler to our Lord Jesus Christ? It was the school bus. It was the law. And he came to our Lord Jesus Christ and said, What must I do to be saved? And what happened was the law took him to Christ, but then when Christ gave him the correct doctrine, he stayed on the school bus and didn't get off and rode that school bus right to hell. And that's exactly what happened to him. So what, what the law does, it's like a school bus that takes us to a point where we know we are out of line, we know we are sinners, and we know, therefore, we need a Savior. So thus the law became a pedagogue, which leads us to Christ, so that we might be declared righteous. In the Greek, again, it's once and for all. To be declared righteous once and for all by faith. The only way we can become righteous is by faith. Faith alone in Christ alone. And again here we have subjunctive mood by our own volition. Now coming up we will see that, the, that until sal salvation we are noted as minor children and no greater than slaves. And at salvation we go through something called adoption and become adult sons in union with Christ. Now, we know adoption today is different. When you're adopted today, uh, you, someone from another bloodline adopts you out of your own bloodline from your original mother and father. Maybe your original mother and father were creeps and they didn't want to have any type of children, so you were adopted out. But that's not the adoption given here in the Bible. The adoption given here in the Bible is different and related to the history of the time. So now in Galatians 3.25, But after that, faith has come. 
We are no longer under a pedagogue. P-A-I-D-A-G-O-G-E. Once faith has come, we're no longer under a pedagogue. No longer under someone taking us to school and teaching us. We will know even more about this in a moment because Paul will expound upon this. And what this means in Galatians 3.25 is once you believe in Christ, you get off the school bus. The law took you to Christ, showed you that you were a sinner. And once you realized you were a sinner, you got off the school bus. But many people stay on the school bus and drive it back to school bus hell. That's the way it, that's the way it works. So, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a pedagogue. Once you believe in Christ, you get off the school bus. But the rich young ruler did not get off the school bus, and he rode that bus straight to hell. Now in Galatians 3.26. Galatians 3.26. This is linear action start starting out. For you keep on being all the children of God. Children of God here again is mature sons, we us. And we noted the difference, and we will note it again. Mature sons is we us. For you keep on. Linear actions are meaning you can't stop being. For you keep on being all the children of God through the instrumentality, through the agency of faith in Christ Jesus. Now, in the Bible, Christ is described as we us, and we are descri described as quioi, which is plural, which indicates union with Christ. And we've noted the difference between technon and we us, and we'll note it again a bit later. And when we have faith alone in Christ alone, it makes us adult sons of God. And that is, when you believe in Christ, you become we us. Adult sons of God, and we will note it again, the toga and all that's related to becoming 14 years of age as a young man. Galatians 3.27. In Galatians 3.27, we have the principle of inheritance. For all of you who have once and for all, once again, and then we have baptizo, in which you have baptism for once and for all you receive baptism is probably what it says in your Bible. But what it means is, for all of you have once and for all received identification. That's what baptizo means. In the Greek, B-A-P-T-I-D-Z-O means you've once and for all received identification. And you receive by identification by God the Holy Spirit entering you into union with Christ and then it goes on to say that you have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now this has technical meaning. Clothed yourself with Christ. What, what does that mean? Clothed yourself with Christ. You see, if we don't go back to the history of the time in which this was written, you wouldn't know what clothed with Christ means. But I'll tell you what it means. Before the age of 14, all young men wore a toga but it was a childhood toga. It was not an adult toga. But then when the, uh, the young man reached the age of 14, the father would gather the family together along with all the slaves and the servants and everyone associated with the family. And then he would take off the young man's toga or the, the toga of his youth. Just take it off and he would stand there naked in front of everybody. And then he would get a new toga. And this toga was much more beautiful. And it was a man's toga. And he would give a speech. This is my son, so-and-so, Publius, etc. And I'll put this robe on you. And then now you are an adult son. Now you're an adult. And that's we us, adult son. And now that you're an adult son, you share everything I have. Now you can vote. You can vote for people in the Senate. You have a right to serve in the army now. You have a right to select a wife. This was at 14 back then. doesn't happen now. Today people go to jail doing stuff like that. But at 14, in those days, young man considered adult, 
young man can marry another 14-year-old girl, maybe even a bit younger, and probably sometimes a bit older, but usually the same age or a bit younger. So he says you have a right to get married. And not only now do you have a right to get married, you have certain obligations to your country in serving in the military. You now have certain obligations to your family. Now that you have this freedom, you have responsibility. And by the way, now you have your own bank account that I've created for you. That was what the father would say. I've given you a bank account. And you see, in the olden days, the parents didn't wait until they dropped dead to give the inheritance away. And when you think about it, if, you are, if you're worth, let's say, $20 million, it would be better that you give that money to your children before you die than afterwards because they'll tax it at about 49%. Called a death tax, an evil tax in this country. Didn't exist back then. But back then, they didn't even wait till death. If they had the means, if they had the means of funding their own children, they would get for them a pretty big bank account by the time they were 14. And what they would do is just have an old, a separate bank account and they would give it to a slave. And this slave would handle the money and it would be an honorable slave who had interest in the family. And so they, usually they would not rip them off. And they would say, all right, slave, I'm giving you this much out of my paycheck as it were back then. And you put it in a bank account for my son so that when he reaches 14, he'll have a good nest egg already. And then at the age of 14, suddenly, the young man would look in his bank account and have 100,000 drachma or something like that. Now, if he hadn't been trained correctly and if he hadn't been trained responsibly, first thing he would go do is go out and uh, buy a chariot with gold rims and just blow all his money right there. But it would be his choice, and that's what uh, he would do. But back then, they seemed to be a bit more responsible. So in, uh, especially the nowadays in our culture, maybe the World War II generation was just as responsible as, as these folks. So now in Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. That means there's no racial distinction. There is no racial distinction. There is neither slave nor free. That means there's no social distinction. That means there's neither rich nor poor. One of the most horrible things that can happen to a society is, on the one hand, racism. There's no racial distinction when it comes to the royal family of God. When you've believed in Christ, there is no racial distinction. None. Absolutely not. And if a believer who is white wants to marry a believer who is black, you better not say anything about it or you'll end up just like a, uh, Moses' sister. And she died of leprosy. Why? Because Moses decided he would marry a black Ethiopian. And as a result of Moses marrying a black Ethiopian, she became very jealous and she herself made an issue out of it. And then she woke up one morning with leprosy. And then Abraham, I mean Moses, interceded and said, don't let her die, God, but she died anyway. You don't mess around with racism, and this is part of the Bible. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. No racial distinction in the spiritual life. Continuing, there is neither slave nor free, no social distinction. Meaning, you, if a rich person were to walk into this uh, church, you should not treat them with any more respect than you would a poor person who walks into this church. No racial distinction in terms of how far you can go in your spiritual life. Remember, the Apostle Paul was oftentimes poor, and the Apostle Paul was oftentimes well off, and he learned how to be happy in each and every case. But what happens in society today, if you're poor, you have a tendency to be envious of the rich. Yes, tax the rich, because I'm not. They shouldn't be rich, because I'm not rich. And I envy them. And that's part of evil, and not biblical. And it is part of the Democratic Party. And there are applications to the way the people vote, etc., in the Bible, if you just know what the Bible says. 
And that doesn't mean if Democrats walk in here, I'm going to chew them out. They'll just learn that they're out of line. After a while, they'll learn there is no such thing as voting for taxing the rich because uh, you're not rich and you're envious. There's no social distinctions. There is neither male nor female, meaning there's no distinction among the sexes in that there's no distinction that they can go to spiritual maturity. And a woman can go to spiritual maturity just as fast as a man. And if she, if she so has the volition, she can go there faster than a man. So don't think because you're sitting here as a female, you can't get to maturity as fast as a man can. A man might throw around his weight, but that's arrogance. You can get there just as fast, if not faster. You can get there faster. It's all about volition. What this is saying is you have the opportunity to go to play Roma, to Theu, whether you're man or woman, whether you're slave or rich, whether you're black or white, whether you're Gentile or Jew, whether you're Asian, whatever you are. You're a human being, and if you've believed in Christ, you've received 39 irrevocable absolutes plus one. You've received the ability to use the two power options, the three spiritual skills, the four spiritual mechanics. You've been given exactly, equally, and this is the only time you're ever put on an equal plane is when you believe in Christ, and you're equal. And all this racism that goes along. And there's a lot of racism around here. Even today, I hear it. And I don't like it one bit. Thought we got past that in this country. But we haven't because there's no pivot of mature believers. And if, if a uh, young black man believes in Christ and grows in grace and in knowledge, he can go just as far and farther than a white man who does it. And this is the Bible speaking, not me. Galatians 3.28. Now moving on. And then it goes on to say, For you are all one in Christ Jesus. We're all part of the same family, all part of the same royal family of God. And if any of you ever envy anyone for having greater wealth than you or having more than you have, you're so far out of line and so far outside the spiritual life, it's disgusting, and I want to go vomit. There is, if you are envious of people because you think they have more than you and have more wealth, there's something wrong in your soul. And on the other hand, if you're rich, and you look down your nose at somebody who doesn't have as much as you, you're disgusting and you need a soul adjustment. But it works both ways. And some of the most arrogant people in the world are not rich, they're poor. And why? Well, they think they need something from the government. They think they deserve something and they think they have a right to be envious of others who have something and have a right to tell the government to tax them more. It's all part of a political system that's even been de developing in our country. Tax the rich because they have more money to be taxed. They earned that money. They earned it. It's called capitalism, and that's divine establishment. And by the way, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been employed by a bum? Have you ever been employed by a poor person, I mean poor, I don't mean somebody who's trying to make end meets and then has a company on the side, that's not poor. I mean, have you ever been employed by somebody who themselves has no money and no job? No. Who provides work in this country? Rich people, like people who own Walmart or who have stake in Walmart. Used to be old Sam Walton. Sam Walton was a rich man. He didn't... Uh, flash it around. I would have, but he didn't. It don't matter if you do or don't, though. He didn't flash around his wealth or anything else. And he provided jobs. Who else? Bill Gates. You envious of Bill Gates? If it weren't for Bill Gates, the unemployment rate in this country would be about 20%. He's provided more... Un you know what I'd do if I were Bill Gates? The government came after me, I'd say, you want to come after me? Well, I got my money. I'll just shut the whole shebang right down. And now you tell me, yeah, you'd all get voted out of office in a hurry because the economy would collapse. But that's where envy comes from. 
Now, I've gone, gone off on a tangent, but there's principles to it. There's principle to Galatians 3.28. And the principle is, there should be no envy either way. And there should be no snobbery. But now, oftentimes, I've noted some of the most snobby people, some of the people who stick their nose in the air highest, are the poor. It's really weird. Now, Galatians 3.29. Galatians 3.29 And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. Now we've studied the promise. What was the promise to Abraham? Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness. That promise has been given to us. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants. All of us here are Abraham's descendants because we've all believed in Christ. And we are huios, heirs according to the promise. And how are we heirs? We are heirs by faith alone in Christ alone. That's how all of us become heirs. Now in this we have equal privilege and equal opportunity as we've been noting. When we believe in Jesus Christ, every single one of us receives equal privilege and equal opportunity to advance in this unique spiritual life. There is no excuse for failing in this spiritual life. For each and every one of us has been given the exact same thing when we believe in Christ. When I believed in Christ, I was given 39 irrevocable absolutes plus one. When you believed in Christ, you were given 39 irrevocable absolutes plus one the filling of God the Holy Spirit. We all have access to the two power options. All of us. Those people who went to church this morning all around the country, those who had believed in Christ, have access to the two power options. And you say, well, they never heard of it because they never wanted to hear it because God is fair. And they have equal privilege and equal opportunity, but God is not going to waste his time on negative volition, and neither should you. You should not waste your time hanging around negative volition. You should not waste your time trying to change negative to positive. It doesn't work. Ever tried it with a battery? It won't work. Going to change the negative side to the positive side? If you do that and switch it around, the battery blows up. If you're negative, you're negative, and if you're positive, you're positive. And the reason why this church is not overflowing has nothing to do with personality, has nothing to do with me, has everything to do with negative volition, which is pervasive around this area and around the country. And that's why we are in danger of going under the fifth cycle. So we all have access to the two power options. And if you want to know what they are, God would send them to a place where they could learn it. Do you think God is so powerless he cannot send people who are positive to a place where they can get it? You would be amazed at all the story of, uh, stories I've heard about people who got positive toward the word and how God sent them the information. Well, they didn't even have to go. They would just uh, suddenly see something in the trash, pop it in their tape player and say, well, this is phenomenal. i got to get some of this. Or they'll look on the Internet and pop, up comes something, and oh, I've got to get some of this. And it can happen anywhere. Look, if God can send a man from India, see, all the way around the world, he looks up on the internet, finds me, requests material, Moses on Wabiko goes over there and everything and gives them some information that they want. If it can happen all the way over in India, why do you question why it can't happen here? It would happen here if people would get positive. People aren't going to get positive until we have an explosion of anthrax or until we have an explosion of bird flu or until the economy gets so bad you have to pay nine bucks a gallon for gas or until people have nothing else to do on their Sunday. They can't hop around on those things anymore because they can't afford them. What will they do? They better turn toward the Word or we'll be wiped out. So where there is freedom to access these spiritual gifts is everywhere, and we all have that freedom. 
and uh, even in places like China where they don't even have the freedom we have there are people accessing and utilizing the two power options very few but there are a few in China there are a few in Russia who have gotten with the word but in America we have the biggest remnant but it's fading away because the people who had it are starting to die off and now we need a generation to, to turn around to the word of God but they're so sucked into the prosperity of this day and we are a very prosperous nation I can tell you there is no nation more prosperous than us have you ever been outside of our borders if you have I've been to Mexico and Mexico is by far not the most poor nation on earth but compared to us it's a shithole and here we are in the United States of America with all this wealth and all this wealth has become distracting to us so what makes us unequal as royal family of God what has made us unequal I'll tell you what's made us unequal volition now you have equal privilege and equal opportunity but you can take your volition and say no nah, I don't want it or you can take your volition and say there are other things more important you can take your volition every day and do with what you want that's your business but you have equal privilege and equal opportunity to become as great as the Apostle Paul who wouldn't want to be as great as the Apostle Paul So what makes us unequal is our attitude and what we put as the importance in life. What is most important? Are we going to be lovers of pleasure or are we going to be lovers of God? Now this doesn't mean that you have to become a hermit and not have fun. I love the Word of God with all my heart, mind, soul, all of it. But I still have fun. You can tell by my red face. I went swimming yesterday and had a blast that Saturday is my day off today everyone else swam and I think I couldn't I had to study so what so um, so that I could give this to you but the fact is it's your attitude toward the Word of God that is makes the difference and you can move to play Roma to that and what happens then when you move to spiritual maturity you become a blessing by association to everyone around you and not only to your family but to your city then to your county then to your state then to your nation and if you become a missionary internationally and you have an impact in the angelic conflict conflict and when you uh, arrive in heaven there'll be no shame associated with you now right now it's none of my business where you are spiritually or how interested you are in the word never has been and never will be but I'm going to tell you that when you get to the Bema and when our Lord Jesus Christ evaluates you everyone is going to know where you stand everyone I'm going to know you're going to know where I stand hopefully I'll make it who knows but hopefully I will you're going to know where I stand and everyone else is going to look at you see people get the idea they're all about approbation lust what do people think about me well let me bring it to you in the terms of thinking and approbation lust what are they going to think when you're all a bunch of losers but see it's not going to matter because most of them will be losers and the upper echelon won't care about you anyway but that's the way people think in the old sin nature what do people think about me well get away from that what do people think about me what does Jesus Christ think about you that's the issue now he loves you you have believed in Christ he loves you with the perfect love but when you get to heaven would you rather hear well done my good and faithful servant or be looked at with a shamedness and to be ashamed because you did not execute the spiritual life and you were given every opportunity equal privilege and equal opportunity the same opportunity the Apostle Paul was given you've been given what would you do with it that's what that's going to be the question what would you do with it there's a country song about that the guy's dying he, out, he finds out he's dying and then 
a part of the song says, what'd you do with it? Well, he went skydiving, but um, <laughs> what'd you do with it other than that? What'd you do with this life? Some people live as if uh, tomorrow's guaranteed. I was watching the news the other day. Well, this one congressman, what happened to him was he was in his office and he was opening the door and going out for lunch or something and one of the Capitol Police was standing there and got shot right in front of his eyes. And that kind of shook him up. He's a believer. His name's Tom DeLay. He's just left Congress. And uh, he put on his congressional desk a sign that said, today could be your day. He started thinking about his mortality. He said, today I could be like that police officer and be dead. So he got motivated in his own way and he said, well, and he even said this on Fox News. He said, well, the resurrection could occur today or I could die today and I got to make sure my life's in order. Now, the way he thought of it, who knows how he thought of it. I don't know a spiritual life. But that's the way we should think too. We should live our lives in the light of eternity. Our lives are short. Even if we live to be 100 years old, that's a short life. And we could all die tomorrow. This bird, bird flu thing's going crazy over in Asia. It may never come to fruition. But if it starts coming over here, some people predict it could wipe out a third of our own population. Are you going to be scared? Well, if you don't have the spiritual life, you'll be terrified. We'll all be wearing masks culling up in our houses. Say, so let's go to church. No, I might catch the flu. That's when that's the place you should be learning the word and it's better to learn it now and to be prepared for these events when they occur I'm not saying they're going to I'm no prophet hopefully we can go on in prosperity until we all drop dead but it's very unlikely when you look at the historical trends and the historical trend lately has been a massive movement away from doctrine massive in the 1800s they taught dispensationalism today they teach friend day on June 25th I didn't know it was that big church over there when I read that, found it out later. And that big church over there having friend day as if they need more members. <laughs> friend day now. Friend day. Friend day? What about Christ? What about doctrine? Let's make friends. Well, when everything gets bad, nobody really thinks about friends. In fact, friends start slitting each other's throats. When people start to starve, things start to change. And nobody's interested in entertainment anymore. They can't afford it. And entertainment, by the way, is the last thing that goes. But anyway, we move on. We will move on in the next hour with the doctrine of adoption. The doctrine of adoption, and that's because it's going to come out in chapter 4. We're going to deal with adoption. And then we're going to deal with uh, inheritance which has a lot to do with what I've been telling you right now. We have an eternal inheritance. And by the way, we have an inheritance we can receive right here, right now on the earth. A wonderful inheritance. And it doesn't mean that if you get to spiritual maturity, you're going to have all the wealth in the world. Far from it. If that were true, the Apostle Paul would have been the wealthiest man ever on earth. It has to do with spiritual wealth, not monetary things. Pastors today say, you want to go rah, rah, rah for God, you'll be blessed. And they always talk about money. Well, when money is, when you're the master of money, whether you have a little bit or a lot, you're happy. So if you want to be happy, you've got to get serious with the Word. And if you want to turn this country around, you've got to get serious with the Word. It's the only way. And it's not happening. It's just not happening, not in this area. Hopefully it's happening somewhere so that we can have our nation continue because I love my country. I don't wish anything bad on this country or anyone. I hate when people suffer and I hate when people are in poverty, etc. I'd rather we all just go on in riches and prosperity because of a blessing by association with mature believers. But there's got to be mature believers for that to happen. And maybe you'll be the one standing in the gap. But it, be t it depends upon your attitude. What is your attitude? Do you resent coming to church? Do you resent me? There's no reason to resent me. I'm just teaching what the Word says. 
if you resent me, you're resenting the word, just as they said with Samuel. So I'm not here to insult anybody. I'm just giving you the word. And if you resent the word, are you going to resent the word? Are you going to hate it? Would you rather be doing something else right now? If you would, God will take that something else away from you faster than you can blink your eye. You see, I've seen, I've noticed a lot of things. Some of you should think about this because I've seen a lot of the cars that come in here that are all bashed up and young people, 20 years old and younger, being bashed up and dead just like that. And then they go to eternity. Wherever they go, we don't know. If they're believers, they go to heaven. If not, they go to hell. But just like that, life's taken away. And it can be taken away just like that with you. Shoot, I could drive out today in a tractor trailer. Bloom, smash me away, and up to heaven I go. Are you prepared for that? Or does it terrify you? If it terrifies you, you need to, get, you need to start learning the word. Oh, you'll go to heaven terrified or not, of course, eternal security. But most people would be terrified at that. And when you see it, your stomach gets queasy, etc. That's normal. Nothing wrong with that. But still, are you terrified by death? Or would, if it were to occur, would it not matter? Well, if you've been growing in grace and in knowledge, you would understand it doesn't matter. It's been God's timing. And if you're going to be scared, it means... You did not follow your equal privilege and equal opportunity in the right way. So we need to start living our lives in the light of eternity. All these other details of life need to become subordinate. What do most people do today? Where's my thing? Most people today, well, this is the most important thing in life. Whatever it is, this is what it is. details the details of life and we all have details one of them's money uh, another one's friendship that's a detail family life while important and a part of divine establishment is still a detail social life detail oh you can think of anything getting a brand new car detail uh, the weather, detail. You know, if it gets hot, people get mad. If it's comfortable, they don't. Details of life. What, what, mu what must happen is you must become a master of the details of life. And you can do that with doctrine. You can be the master of the details of life. And what makes you a master of the details of life? Your priorities are straight. If your priority says, Details are number one. What happens? You see, you could have money and make money and make all kind of money, and you say to yourself, this is a detail of life that will make me happy. And then you get it, and you do have pseudo-happiness, minus H. You will have minus H from it for a while. But guess what? When you lose it, that means the details are a master of you. Because if you lose the money, you start crying. If you have the money, you start smiling. But if you are a master of the details of life, you smile all the time, and, as it were, in sharing the happiness of God. And this is the only, the only way you can get to this point and become a master of your own life is through doctrine. Otherwise, whatever circumstance in life comes along, it's going to distract you. And as a result, you see... The reason why our country's been blessed so much is because in the past we've had a large pivot and there were a lot of believers who could handle this prosperity. But every country in the world has failed prosperity testing. Every country ever. We are no exception. We're about due to start losing some of it. And the Roman Empire was the longest lasting in terms of its prosperity and its most prosperous time lasted about 200 years. And we're heading at about that point. And then after that, downhill, 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 and we will go downhill. But you can change all that by positive volition, by your attitude. But it comes from your own motivation and your own soul. I can't give you that motivation. Boy, do I ever try. Boy, do I ever try to impart to you a motivation. But still, I realize I can't do it unless you want it called volition and if you want it you can you can have it 
You see, I might motivate you where you say, that was great, I'll come back tomorrow. But then tomorrow I might study something like uh, infralapsarianism and oh, that wasn't encouraging, out the door you go. See, it, it takes an attitude where you just got to know doctrine. Whatever it is, whatever the subject, you got to know it. And some subjects that I teach, they're not really boring to me, but there are some I would rather teach than others, of course. But it's all the Word of God. So with your head bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we've noted. In Christ's name we ask it.